Good evening, WBSC and Whiskey Network fans. Tonight, we bring you whiskey drinkers from all over the world, a tribute to the unparalleled master distiller, Jim McEwen. We hope that everyone got their tasting kits from Dramful. Boom! Uh, with the taste of Jim's distilling history. Uh, the kits include Bowmore 15 year old, a Brook Lottie 2012, a Port Charlotte 2012, and the one that kind of frightens me a little bit, the Octomore version 11.1, five year old with the heaviest peat in the industry at 136.9 parts per million. Uh, please welcome our panel. Tonight, of course, you all know me. I'm Chad Cadden. Uh, joining me, as always, is Bill Brunell, co-founder of WBSE and the Whiskey Network. Uh, we also have Mark Pruitt, Whiskey Network staff writer and author of the final public interview with Jim McEwen. Uh, also, in the beautiful hat, uh, the we tipple. Did I say that right? Yeah, the we tipple. Uh, the we tipple. Uh, Julia Mann, uh, Whiskey Network staff writer. Uh, for our single malt section and our assistant editor. And our special guest tonight is Udo Sontag. Hopefully I got that pretty close, Udo. Uh, Blended. Just recently released the book, A Journeyman's Journey, uh, the Jim McEwen story. Uh, we have with us Greg Schwartz, the re director of the whiskey film, The Water of Life, and Alphonse Defans Palaima, uh, who is the producer. So cheers, everybody, and welcome. Cheers, Lange. Chad. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, Lange. That right, didn't I? I'm Fonz. You nailed it. <laughs> Three weeks of yeah. practice. Me Perfect. and Bill were sitting there, and he, Pailaima. Pailaima. Mm. Well, did you did were you hiding in the bushes, Bill, and then he just mouthed it for you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a little inside joke, guys. <laughs> so welcome everyone. If you haven't already poured your samples in the following order, please do so. The Beaumore, Brooklotti, Port Charlotte, and Octomore in that order. Uh, the tasting will follow the life of Jim's career and we we'll also suggest that you have some sort of palate cleanser between pours. So I'm going to do a brief bio of Jim. Uh, as you know, Jim was born on a whiskey island. Uh, the distilleries in Scotland were built and the towns were built around the distilleries and people came and built their homes around the distilleries because that's where the jobs were. Uh, at a very young age, Jim was drawn to the distillery by the sights and the smells, but more on that later. Jim left school at the young age of 15 and started working at Beaumont sweeping floors and later painting, all the while wanting to be a cooper. Uh, after working hard, proving himself, along with much bargaining, luck, little influence here and there, he was allowed to join the Cooper's Union as an apprentice. He learned his trade well under Master Cooper named David Bell. The next step in Jim's career uh, was training to be a blender. And in all, Jim spent 38 years at Beaumont. In the year 2000, Jim had the opportunity to partner with other investors to purchase the mothballed Brooklady Distillery. This was not only a legendary move for the distillery, but it allowed Jim to help revitalize the town. And that was very close to Jim's heart, as you'll hear more in this story as we move along. And as they say, the rest is history. Chad? The moment we've been waiting for, everybody. Uh, hopefully you got your glasses poured already. I just finished mine. Uh, we are going to drink some history. Let's raise them up and let's get it in. Uh, the first sample we're going to do is the Bowmore 15-year-old. Uh, Greg, would you like to introduce a little bit more about this one? I'd love to. So um, this is we're doing this a little out of the order that you would probably do in just a generic tasting tonight because one of the things we wanted to do is tell Jim's story in order because this is a peated whiskey. It's not anywhere near as peated as some of the later whiskeys, but it is a, a, a peated whiskey. But 
it really is kind of the iconic centerpiece to the beginning and the, the, the length, lengthwise, the biggest part of Jim's career. Um, but more, I believe, Udo, help me with this. It's the second oldest legal distillery in Scotland, correct? Um, uh, it is, it is. It's definitely the oldest yeah. on Isla. And, Established 1779, I think. And it has the oldest warehouse in all of Scotland, and part which is actually so close to the shore that part of it is below sea level. So that's why they think it's this incredibly special lock that makes incredibly special whiskey. Um, one of the things that I've always liked about Bullmore is it's one of the most inst ugh, instantly recognizable spirits right away because you get smoke, but you also get this big kind of pineapple kick. And then on the, this one, the 15-year-old, it's uh, finished in sherry casks. And so it has this really kind of nice balance of all these different, uh, it's like a triangulated flavor, if you will. But there's this kind of tropical thing going on with Bowmore's that I always love. And and I don't, I have to admit, I don't drink them as much as I drink some of the other whiskeys later, but I, I do love them when I get them. And, um, oh, another thing I wanted to say too, for people watching tonight, if, you know, if, if people want to, in addition to asking questions, tell me Bill and Chad, if it's cool, I, I would love to hear what other people think of the whiskey as well when they, when they try them, you know, if someone's going to, instead of asking questions, they could type something in about their own thoughts. Yeah. If uh, anybody has any questions or comments about these whiskeys, uh, throw it in on the Facebook group, uh, while you're watching the video and we are monitoring it, uh, we will try to get to them as time permits, uh, we do got a kind of a big yeah. night, so absolutely we'll do what we can. Um, so what do you guys tell me? Tell me a little bit what you guys think. I don't know if you guys have had how many of you had the Bowmore 15 before. Uh, so do this we, is the first time for me. I had one on Wednesday night. Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, the director of the film. You know, you were Bill saying I, something about the pineapple uh, that is extremely prevalent in, in, in the nose. Mm hmm. Yeah, this, this is, is my, my first one more as well and it's surprisingly approachable as i'm relatively newer to the big distinctive isla whiskeys this is it's right proper i uh, agree a... this is my first uh rodeo with the with the Bomore, and and it, it is surprisingly approachable on the nose i'm definitely getting that pineapple and some sort of a like a dried fruit uh, almost uh, that I'm kind of picking up and I'm, I'm also picking up maybe a, like a leathery note a little bit on sure. the note. Yeah. I think the fun thing with this one so far, I just had my first sip of it. Uh, the nose is super sweet, uh, but when you get to the palate side of things, you get this uh, cocoa, uh, just, just a slight cocoa taste to it. Uh, along with the sherries and the sweetness, but it, it was, I just thought the the play off the nose was so different than the initial first taste. Yeah, there's definitely a sweet perfumey vibe going on on the nose for me. And you know that used to be a big thing. There was a period of a uh, Beaumont where some of the whiskeys got too perfumey for a lot of people, I think. But um, they've certainly gotten away from that. I mean, it's certainly tempered that nowadays. And the thing I always like about Bomore is you definitely, they talk about tropical fruit a lot with Bomore, but the, I always get, a, it's not just pineapple, it's pineapple that has been roasted, like, like the pineapple that would be on top of a ham kind of thing, Yeah. where yeah. it's kind of, it's got like a cooked pineapple, and that, I think that's the smoke playing with the pineapple. Yeah, you got a little bit of that sweet, smoky meat vibe going on on the palate, definitely. Yeah. So, so Greg, uh, 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 could you tell us a little bit about Jim's influence on this uh, particular sure. Bomore? Well, you know, I think one of the things that leads to Jim's act two, if you will, in, in life was that he, I think he loved Bomore. He was born in Bomore. He loved Bomore whiskey. But I think by the time when Jim was born, Bomore was hundreds of years old. And I don't, I, I, he didn't have any, uh, anywhere near the creative freedom he would later have. And I think that meant a lot to him, which is why he took a relatively risky move in his life later. But we'll get to that in a bit. I don't want to steal anyone else's thunder. But um, <laughs> as, as Bill said in the introduction, you know, Jim started working at Bomore at a very young age. Uh, and even, you know, even if it was officially 15, he, he'll happily tell you, and I'm sure the, the book will tell you as well, that the he was doing odd jobs there as, as at eight or 10 years old. Um, and, you know, as our, our film shows, he would he would skip school and the guys at the warehouse would pay him a couple of coins to sweep floors and things like that. And his mom always caught him because they had floor maltings and he smelled like peat smoke when he came home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
uh, which is one of my favorite bits in the movie. But, and, and, you know, and as Bill Moore matured uh, in during, you know, dur during Jim's tenure, I think it, it really kind of got locked into a core range that is, you know, like so many distilleries do. Uh, um, and I think that this 15 is absolutely a big part of that core range where it's a it's a really well balanced whiskey that's kind of doing everything that Bill Moore does, but it's not doing any of it too much. Um, and I think that, you know, Jim, his role in this whiskey was really refinement rather than creation. You know, this whiskey was created, not this glass, but I'm saying, you know, the, the design of this whiskey was a hundred years before he was born. Um, so he was like a, uh, uh, a helmsman on a ship, you know, that was already built and out, out to sea. Yeah, I think that story, you... that story rings true if you... I think it was Udo that provided that photograph of Jim at the at the window of the malt room and him recounting the story of, you know, to get to school, he had to walk by the distillery and this this window was just emanating the smell. And, I, you know, these are these are his words that he was having this olfactory orgasm from what was coming through the window. So it's absolutely true that it was a little earlier than 15 that, you know, he might have been uh getting pulled in and doing some odd jobs alphonse if you have that picture drop it in you're oh, muted your mic's off alphonse i see that i i'm currently looking for it right now yes okay <laughs> so um, greg uh, your, your comment about uh the pineapple grilled on top of a ham Made yeah. me think about that, and this whiskey would pair perfectly with a baked ham with pineapple on top of it. And I have to say, for those of you watching that haven't uh, attempted or approached a peated whiskey, this one's easily approachable. Uh, Chad and I will both tell you that neither this is not the campfire. This is not the iodine. Iodine. This is, uh, this is not. Uh, burning gym socks that's been worn all day long. Uh, this is a kind of mild peta whiskey. Uh, everything about it, I mean, it, it's really a, a fantastic expression. Uh, the sherry isn't over overpowering. The, uh, the the barley shines through. The the peat is just just there to let you know that it's an islay and great great whiskey and a great representation of uh jim's beginning greg, yeah, I, you know, and, go ahead Mark. Uh, uh greg or or udo i kind of have a follow-up question on sort of the making of it and, and was how much of that was the suntory influence you know the traditional sort of japanese management that we're gonna we're gonna achieve this consistency and this perfection in this product and we're going to do it the same same way every time. How much of that influence was there in your opinion? Udo, you want to answer that or you want me to? Well, well I think uh, as far as Jim told me, uh, the Japanese um, mother concern actually trusted in what they have done for ages. And uh, so they relied on the uh, quality, they relied on, on the spirit. And, and this is, I think, a very good example. If you are familiar with Beaumors and you smell the nose and you smell the taste, you get the DNA of that distillery really good. That is what, what Beaumors is all about. And um, the way they, they keep this, um, this quality and this profile of, of flavors, they have been doing this on and on and on. And, and so I think, um, there's a lot of, of, of trustment in this way of, of uh, keeping the quality at the same level. So they just didn't, they what enhance you say, the Greg? tradition. Yeah. Yeah. What and I, you say, Greg? I, I absolutely agree with what you said, but I also think that um, Bomore, before Bomore was owned by Centauri, it was already a very traditional distillery. And it was at a time when no one was encouraged to be experimenting. You know, there were, it just wasn't sort of part of where whiskey was at the time, at least not in Scotland. You know, um, they, were, they were doing it right. There was no need to change that. And I think that's probably what made it appealing to Suntory. And, you know, and for people, I assume most of the people watching this are in the US. And I think that we're all gonna start seeing a lot more 
but more in the U.S. now because it hasn't ever been overly common here. And I think it'll be much more common because Beam, you know, Jim Beam and, and Suntory merged. And so now this is part of Beam Suntory. And I, I think they're making a big play to put more but more in the U.S. these days. This is fantastically approachable. It, it, it is such a, an incredible balancing act of a lot of different flavors. I, I, as I'm sort of nosing this and drinking this along with the discussion, uh, I am picking up uh, an incredibly earthy uh, salinity, a note of salinity uh, kind of on the back end of this, the finish of this. This is just a fantastic experience start to finish. It is absolutely incredible. Yeah, I'm enjoying some of the notes that are coming out now that it's had a chance to open up a little bit. I'm getting a really intense brown sugar note and almost a dried mango vibe. It's just, it's very exciting and it's very delicious. So if you think you don't well, like peated Isla whiskeys, I encourage you to give a more a try because, mm, good. What I find fun about this, uh, mostly being a bourbon drinker, is when I do venture into the scotch whiskeys, I do like trying to, what's a good crossover bourbon or scotch for the bourbon drinker? And this Bowmore, uh, if you want to ease your way into the slightly peated stuff, this is a really good expression. You got a lot of depth going in here. So as a bourbon drinker, I, I could sit here and enjoy this. The proof is a good proof. Uh, the flavor profile is really deep and complex. So as, once again, a bourbon drinker, this is just a great crossover scotch, especially a peated scotch. Now, I want to throw a couple of comments in here from uh, our, our members that are watching. Our whiskey reviewer for our magazine, Robert Diana, says, wonderfully sweet salinity. Um, and then I had someone say the Bowmore 12 he has is great. Uh, Kirk Condon says the, the fruitiness hangs around after the finish. And then we got John Vo Voimos. I uh, hope I didn't butcher your name, John. I love the viscosity and how that once the burn dissipates, it leaves a delicious flavor on the palate. There's the photo that just got shared. That's, that's just such an iconic photo. I love it. Maybe that's... to explain this little, little picture. Okay. Uh, oh. This, this, uh, window was on uh, Jim's halfway to school and he had to pass on this picture each single day he turned to school and we're talking about a distance of let it be 400 meters the most and after 200 meters this window came along and each single day he looked inside and for him it was a view into a new universe I would say. And uh, it was only, it wasn't only the, the man working, it was the smell coming out. And there was fire, there was tobacco, there was small, there was smoke, there was sweat. And, and all these uh, flavors, all these aromas uh, caused in him, uh, I would say something very magical. And uh, each day he came along and looked through this window. He hoped that somebody shouts out of this window and said come in forget school today just come in and <laughs> one day it happened and it was and he was maybe nine or ten years old and he was so proud of of uh, entering this uh, this malting floor and and feel like one of the real man because when you work inside that house you are a really really man and um there he got his very first pants uh, earned the very first wage he received were empty bottles of lemonade and he got the deposit from the uh from the <laughs> market next door and, and he was proud as he could be to bring this few coins at home and say look this is my contribution for for today and that was magical i was i was lucky to uh to experience um and to see him uh reliving this situation again when I when I walked with him uh, last September uh, along his school way and uh, these were really magical moments and when I when I smell this whiskey here it is also the smell of uh, of the surrounding of the distillery there's that little hint of smoke in it there's the wood in it and in Beaumont they're doing their own malting 
a, a part of it and, and, and all you have is in here. And when you hear that that is a, a peated whiskey, I can tell you, don't be afraid. The, the fear of an, of an um, malty whiskey is absolutely healable. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you, can, you can absolutely uh, deal with that. And this is really an easy one. This one was maturing 15 years in a cask, 15 years in wood, like this. And uh, the longer a peated malt matures in a, in, a, in a cask, the more the smoke goes down and the wood uh, overtakes. And this is, in my opinion, a really perfect combination of uh, smokiness uh, and wood combining together. And that is really something very special. And uh, I don't only recognize in here the pineapple and the mixture of pineapple with smoked ham is something that is committed as a crime here in Germany. <laughs> you can't combine that. Uh, but uh, there's also kind of, uh, I would call it chocolate note. I don't know if you mm -hmm. have discovered this as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Chad said that, yeah. Yeah, I get that uh, on the palate. Yeah, a chocolate note with uh, with a note that my my kids wouldn't eat, and I'm not talking about the alcohol, but with a high rate of of cacao of of that. Uh, oh, like a dark chocolate, uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, dark definitely. chocolate, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So, how about we move to the second sample? Uh, it's a Brook Lottie, Islay Barley, 2012, 50 percent ABV, uh, Udo. It's your turn to introduce yeah. this one. Um, yeah, <clears throat> this uh, whiskey is a very, very special whiskey because it was made in a distillery um, that has quite a lot of history. I think we will uh, explain that um, afterwards as well. But uh, in this whiskey, a very special idea um, came through, which hasn't been done before. None of the Scotch uh, whiskey distilleries made up a mind of where they get their barley from. And um, Jim, when he created this whiskey, uh, was thinking of uh, his ingredients he used. And when we talk about Scotch whiskey, we talk about three ingredients, which is yeast, which is water, in which is barley. And uh, <clears throat> the guy that uh, who was also involved in, in the company uh, who, who bought it was Mark Renier and he was a wine dealer. And in the wine business, you talk about terroir. That means the place where the, the grapes grow. And this idea was translated into barley. And so the idea came up uh, and there was a slogan saying, we believe terror matters. We believe that the, the place where the barley is growing makes a huge difference. And that really sounds like, uh, let's say a huge marketing uh, effect or just, uh, just PR. And, uh, but I have to tell that this is not uh, true. Um, it has absolutely an influence in what, uh, where, where the barley grows. Because I was once invited by Bruhladi and uh, I was part of a real impressive tasting. And Alphonse, you, you have um, some pictures and one of them is a man ex explaining with two hands. And this man we will see now is uh, Carl Reavy. And Carl Reavy was uh, somebody, he's unfortunately no longer with us, but uh, he was somebody who had, uh, I would say the, well, that is the distillery and there you can see, uh, I can see the whiskey, but uh, I'd like to, to, I would love to have the, the man explaining. Uh, and um, this man, um, he was uh, telling in a way uh, about Bali, other men talk about cars or whatever. He had, he was so fascination. And I thought, well, it, we're talking just of, of a grain. 
And then I was a witness uh, of, a, of a tasting and I had some new make whiskies in front of me. Well, you, you don't uh, supposed to be called them whiskey, new make spirit. Maybe we, you could show the, the, the picture with the glasses, Alphonse. And we lost were, Alphonse. We've, we, we lost, okay. He's then, having some uh, problems. Uh, so just imagine you have uh, some glasses in front of you with pure liquid uh, that looks like water. And it was a kind of experiment. It was the same, uh, <clears throat> the same sort of, of grain, but uh, grown on different places. One was grown in Isla and one was grown near Aberdeen. And we had the very brand new making in the glass. Same sort of grain, same distilled, no cask, so just the new make. And we compared each other. And there was such a huge difference. And from that moment on, I'm really convinced that Terra really matters. And Jim recognized this. And uh, so he, he created a whiskey. Oh, there you can see it. Uh, there was it for, for a second. There were these, yeah, here we are. There are the, the brand new mates. Uh, it was in the background. And um, then we had the new make and then we had the, the final result. And uh, what is really special about this whiskey is that here, the cask is not the main player. The main player is the grain. And when you, when you take a little smell of it and put the glass away, you get a huge note of alcohol in your glass the very first time. But the nose is very interesting. Uh, the nose has an ability which I'm really thankful for because the nose can fade out some flavors. That means if you take the glass and roll it a wee bit, you got a huge surface that can react with oxygen and that develops the, the flavor. And when you put it to the nose the second time, you should feel a difference. There should be really something new. The alcohol has just turned a little bit away and, and suddenly there comes the, the grain notes, there comes a little floral note, there comes, uh, well, there comes the terror, I would say. And that is what, this whiskey is all about. It is uh, harvested uh, or the grain was harvested in the year 2011 and it was distilled in the year 2012. And uh, what has started as a kind of uh, idea uh, of taking Isla barley to produce whiskey has uh, now uh, become to, uh, to the major way of, of, of doing whiskey. Over 80% of all farms in Isla produce now their barley for this whiskey or uh, for the Port Charlotte one. And uh, therefore you, you need to, you should uh, take a look at this whiskey from the view what's inside, what's the ingredients. And, and there you can see really something uh, very nice although it's a uh, 50% uh, ABV, but you have that um, beautiful honey notes coming through. You have that beautiful vanilla, but you have also um, the fruitiness. And the fruitiness here comes um, from the, from the ex-bourbon cask it was in. Well, 75% of that was a first full bourbon and 25% was uh, French wine casks. So you have also a uh, very special um, uh, cask management here, but all these uh, influences, the barley, the casks, all these make this whiskey as a very special one. Because if you, if you taste that, you will notice it's a completely unpeated whiskey. It's larger. So, Udo, on that note, I have a question from one of our viewers, Keith Condon. Since this is an unpeated, what or how do they malt the barley? Um, <clears throat> with dry air. With, with, uh, they dried with, with air. From over and, gas. Um, um, 
Brooklady doesn't currently malt their barley on Isla. They malt their barley on the mainland um, because the Isla maltings would only do peated barley. That's all they did was peated. So they wanted it done. So they had to go to the mainland to do it. They're currently building their own floor maltings so they can start doing it. It's the, literally the only thing they don't do in-house. They even do their bottling and labeling in-house. But um, the they're switching. Well, Part of the, the Isla Barleys, the ones we're drinking, they're going to be all malted on bar, on Isla as well soon with unpeated because they can now do natural gas or coal. So it's clean instead of the peat, which gives you the smoke. So we have a comment by Robert Diana uh, that he's getting apples, pears, something like a powdered chocolate and a touch of smoky oak. And a then, smoky oak? Yeah, and then Keith Interesting. says, uh, I swear you can taste the Isla Sea breeze in this gram. It, it, has, me, a, it has a It has a wee uh, salty nod at the end. And that refers yeah. to the uh, to the <clears throat> to the warehouses. Because um, this whiskey matures its whole life nearby the sea. And so the sea influence in the cask. And the, the, the combination uh, of a little sweetness and saltiness together is something that makes um, the flavor much more wider. That increases it. It's, it's, uh, it gives them more layers and uh, combined with the fruity notes. And, and you, you were absolutely right uh, with, with the apple ones or maybe I, I would call them, uh, I would uh, define them also as a kind of well, let's say orange note or exotic fruits, which is the DNA of, of, of the Ladi. Uh, and that fits all very well together. And uh, that's, that's and I think in Scotland, you would say that's a cracker. Udo, you, you hit it right on the head for me. I, on the nose, I get the grain, absolutely. And I get sort of the kiss of the salinity, <clears throat> but on the back end and on the finish, uh, if you ever had a cocktail where, where the bartender takes a piece of the orange rind and, and uses a lighter to torch it. I'm getting I'm getting that on the end of the uh, on the tail end. It's it's that's the best I can describe it. It's fantastic. So you would call you know, it orange citrus? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think absolutely. The, absolutely. the finishes are what really gets me how pronounced it is because it on the nose it's a very soft whiskey. Uh, and your initial taste of it, it it's very delicate in, in a sense, but then that finish just pops and just kind of lingers and hangs around. Uh, Uda, what was uh, kind of Jim's influence with this uh, particular bottling? <clears throat> well, um, it was his idea um, created longer and longer and each day, uh, each year, he tried to get more uh, farms in, into this uh, project, I would say. And the idea is um, to, to get the, um, the farmers a kind of uh, new, new ambition, to give them a, a new old, a new uh, part of uh, their, uh, of their um, uh, how to say in English, of their existence. Jim, uh, um, Consider his, himself as, a, as an ambassador for for Scotland and especially for Isla, and he takes care that <clears throat> Isla uh, will grow. His goal is that people can stay here and have a, a solid future, and not only the, the the people who work in the uh, distillery, but also the farmers. And when they grow barley constantly for Brohladi, uh, then he has done all right and. Uh, the farmers are very proud that they are mentioned on the bottles as well. Because if you buy, uh, buy yourself a, a bottle, you will uh, absolutely see where it comes from. I, I took a note of it. Uh, in this uh, particular whiskey, there were eight farms. It was the coal farm, it was the rockside farm, it was the island farm, the Mondry, Starchmill, Cruerch, Dunlosset, and Sunderland. And uh, that is so that is so uh, special for the farmers being mentioned on such an iconic bottle. And can I, can I add something to that, Udo? Yes, sure. When we were in Australia, Jim said to me, when you're a farmer in Isla and you see a tin come out or a bottle come out with your family's farm on it, 
you have a really good reassurance that you're going to have someone to buy your barley for the next eight years, because that's roughly how old they release these vintages, about eight years. And he said, you know, they would never pivot away from a farm so fast. So, you know, he said it, it is it's a beautiful sentiment to share it, but it's also security. It's a sense of we're part of this and we're going to be because this was made eight years ago and we're still part of it today. And I, I, I hope I shared it. I tried to share an image like all over Isla. You see farms with these signs up that say growing for Brooklady. Yeah. And it uh, worked. Cool. Um, I mean, they're all over the place. The transparency of Brook Laddie is fantastic. That everything from start to finish, they are so honest and straightforward about what they're doing and where they're getting their grains from. It's just terrific. And they were the ones that really pioneered that transparency in the business. Right. Yeah. One thing that we didn't introduce uh, about uh, Julia is that she's our uh, feature writer for the single malt scotch feature in our magazine. So. She's our scotch expert when it comes to writing articles. So having said that, Julia, give us your opinion of this dram. Oh, I think it's absolutely beautiful. And this is the second Brook Laddie that I've had and it is immediately distinctive. The terroir really comes through. It tastes unlike any other scotch I've had. There are many, many great scotches out there but also having a wine background, I really appreciate that they take ownership of their land and using that local source and supporting the farmers and bringing barley growing to Isla. And it, there's just an incredible difference if you taste Brook Laddie and their terroir series versus other scotches, it's undeniable. And I think that is so cool because there are plenty of people who are out there saying, eh, terroir doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you get your barley. Oh, it absolutely matters. It makes an incredible difference. And I just think it comes through in the purity and the character of this spirit. It's absolutely fantastic. Here, here. All fantastic. Beautiful. So as we get into the smoke, if, uh, did you guys have something else uh, to talk about the I was, I was going to just throw in one quick thing if I could, Chad, because I think it's a beautiful little, it's a sad anecdote, but it's a beautiful anecdote. Um, one of the things that during, during the First World War, Britain and Scotland, by extension, um, when, when people would volunteer to sign up for the army in, in the First World War, if you were all from the same town, they would guarantee they would put you in the same unit. And there was a really horrible toll to be paid for that because if one unit was in a horrible battle, all of the young men of that unit would, or that town would get killed and no one would return. And to some degree, that's what happened on Isla during the first world war. And there's a quick line in our movie where Mark said they weren't growing barley on Isla, not since the boys never returned from the first world war. And that's what happened is all of the Eloks who signed up got killed or many of them, not all of them, but many of them did. And so barley farming died on Isla after the First World War, because it became easier for the widows to just put sheep on the land and sell the wool. And so I think Jim is incredibly proud of the fact that he didn't just get engaged these farms. He brought barley back Well, they all did. It wasn't just his mark, certainly, too. They brought barley back to Isla. And I, and I it's such a sad story. It's, it's, I, you know, I find it very hard to even tell that story, you know, but it's true. Like a huge amount of the young men of Isla were killed in the First World War. So. This is sort of fixing that hole that I think had been in the soul of the island for so long. So that's all I wanted to say. Sorry. I made an initial sort of misjudgment about this being in my class because I was swirling it around and I was kind of looking at the, the legs and looking what was kind of happening in the glass. And I took a first glance and maybe it's just because my glass was dirty or whatever. I thought, gosh, this is really thin. And uh, I believe it was Alphonse or Greg that, that shared a picture a close up, a high resolution picture of the glass. And you can literally see the legs of this whiskey sticking to the side of the glass. It's absolutely fantastic. And then tasting it, the viscosity of the mouthfeel, uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. If you swirl this around in your glass, it stays up near where, you're, where you've swirled the liquid around. It, it, it's, there you go. That's, that's the picture. Absolutely perfect. You don't want to see my dirty glass. Look at that glass. Uh, and that is that is absolutely fantastic about this whiskey. I picked that up, and I I just had to share that. 
I'd like to make one comment on what Greg just shared. And as I said in my uh, short bio of Jim, Brooke Lottie is near and dear to his heart. Isla is near and dear to his heart. He brought things back to support the town and make the town what it is today. Uh, as what Greg said, when they lost all the boys during World War I, things started to fall away. And uh, Udo, correct me if I'm wrong here, back in the 1990s when the scotch industry started to fail the town started to fail because that's where the income that's the the lifeblood of that town and that was jim wanted that lifeblood to come back and he wanted the town to succeed and thrive and and that's just an amazing tribute to jim and by the way, we're also celebrating Jim's birthday, which was July 23rd in this tribute. So happy birthday, Jim. Happy birthday. <clears throat> but you, you're right. But, uh, um, but to explain a, a little bit of uh, the effect that Brohladi had, um, I, I just, um, you're talking about the town. Um, uh, we're talking about a little island which is 40 kilometers from north to south and 32 kilometers from east to west. And about 3,300 people live on that island. And when you said uh, that in the mid nineties, whiskey had an incredible image. It was a drink for, for old men, old fashioned guys. And no one was really interested in whiskey. So uh, they shut down the, uh, the distillery. And what effect did it have? The people had to leave the island because there was no work there. Uh, there was no future there. And uh, that was something uh, that was absolutely a horror for Jim, seeing this island dying, bleeding out. And the idea of, um, of bringing Brochladi in 2000 back to life meant that uh, the island gets a new future. The island, uh, or, or, or Brohladi, is on the west side of the island. It looks like more or less like a, a kind of horseshoe, I would say, and it's on the left wing. It's called the Rins. <clears throat> and um, due to the fact that uh, this distillery set a post for a new future, the people could stay on the island. The school stayed open. The, the doctor stayed open. There was uh, the life back to Ireland. And that was so much uh, a sign of, of hope. And everyone turned in when they, when they were recreating it. Everyone turned in and said, can I help? Uh, <clears throat> Jim told that uh, when the first time he entered this in the year 2000, he entered a ruin. If you've seen Greg's film, you've seen the, uh, the warehouses, just uh, no roof on top. And uh, it was really in a really bad shape. And uh, all the people help together. They bring in, in machines or manpower to rebuild this because that was such a sign of hope. And that is also the story of Brohladi. And... Uh, it's such an incredible uh, distillery with so much uh, lovely people working in there. I call them always the Ladi family. And you can feel in each one of them who works there, the passion, the passion for, for the product, the passion uh, for, for the distillery, the passion for Isla. I think uh, Fonzi and Greg, you will agree. You also got to know to these people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we spent years of our lives trying to tell that story. Greg and I um, had a very stimulate. Sorry, Greg. No, go. go. Uh, Greg and I had a very stimulating conversation when we were sort of talking about this, the article that I was going to write in the interview. And well, I'm sure it was probably top of mind for you, Greg, but it was a, it was a revelation that sort of came to me or it was an idea that came to me that, you know, Jim 
was very much invested in the idea of generational craftsmanship. And, it, and it's this idea that it's like his journey as a cooper. He's, he started very young um, when he was sweeping the malt room floor. They would actually give him uh, broken pieces of staves uh, from the barrels. And, and a lot of that formed his early fascination uh, with being a cooper. And, and the things that he did later in his career to sort of bring that forward. You know, Jim didn't have the idea, hey, I'm the whiskey renegade, renegade and I'm, I'm going to do all of these things. He just knew that he was an Isla man. He knew, he knew that he was a true Scot and he lived that. And, and the proof is in the pudding with from the things that he accomplished and what he brought back uh, to the island. So I, I was just kind of thinking about that conversation that you and I had about this, you know, about what, what his idea was or when he came to Brook Lottie, what was it that was driving him? He didn't come to Brook Lottie with the idea of we're going to make something great and, and this is what we're going to do. It, 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 more, it, it came about more naturally than that. You know, you know, a funny take on that is Jim, I, he must have told us six different stories that ended with a certain person coming back to Brook Lottie and each time he said, you can start tomorrow. And we always laughed about how that must have driven Mark and Simon crazy. They're like, you have to stop hiring every single person that comes back to work. Before they had ever started making whiskey, he'd hired, he'd hired more than a dozen people already. Well, looking at Adam Hannett's uh, biography, you know, he started as a tour guide and yeah. he showed affinity to certain things. And, you know, Jim took him under his wing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, the American equivalent is you started in the mailroom and you worked your way up to the CEO. And, you know, it, 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 it's just an incredible story of literally it running through his blood and, and, and emanating out uh, to the island and everything that he did. Can, can I tell you a quick Jim, story that, oh, go ahead, Udo. Jim does have <clears throat> really sensitive antennas for, for people. He told me that uh, he never ever uh, recruited people uh, due to their CV. It's just a look in the eyes, face to face. And, and if you take a look uh, at Alan Logan, who is now the, uh, what's the English Pro word? Production director. Help me, Greg. Produ production director. Production, okay, Pro uh, production director. He started as a painter. He was searching for a job with, with uh, with his gloves and, and with a bucket full of color and said, well, can I, can I uh, paint the distillery? And Jim said, well, actually, we don't need a painter, but we need, uh, but we need uh, you for something else. And now he's the production manager. Mm -hmm. So uh, that shows that Jim is very creative in giving people a chance of doing it. And the way he recruited Adam or he recruited Alan is a beautiful uh, story to tell and, and also to read. I, I, that's a perfect setup to what I, I want I to say. I hope it's in your book. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I have a little quick anecdote that I bet you Udo doesn't even know. So Udo, tell me, tell me the truth if you know this or not. There's a, guy, a young man who works at Brook Lottie now named Raymond Tibbs, and he is Jim's second or third cousin. He wasn't sure himself which one it was. He said, I can never keep track of those whole once removed business. So he was, he's Jim's cousin. And he was, he told us this story that he was a tour guide. And one day Jim came in and said, what size shoe do you wear? And he said, 10. And Jim said, okay, I'll be back in a minute. And he came back with a pair of steel toed boots and he said, put these on. And he said, oh, well, I'm about to leave, lead a tour. And he said, you're not a tour guide anymore. You work in the warehouse now. <laughs> um, and he said, well, I'll let you know at the end of the week, if you're going back to being a tour guide, or if now you're going to work in the warehouse. So he said, that's how he got promoted. <laughs> he asked him what size shoes he wore. And that was the day he got promoted out of being a tour guide into the warehouse. So right man for the job. So we got a question from Kirk Condon again. He says, I'm not very worldly. How far is Isla from the coast of mainland Scotland? And is it only accessible by boat or plane? There are, <clears throat> there are two ways to get to Isla. One is a, a little plane from, from Glasgow, which will uh, take a 45 minutes flight with a propeller machine uh, and it's more shaped. <laughs> and um, if you have the, the opportunity to, 
to book a, a seat at the right side of the plane, take it, and then you have the spectacular view of it from, from the air. And the other one is if you uh, leave with a ferry from a tiny little harbor, I would call it, uh, on the uh, Kintaya Peninsula, it'll, uh, it'll be a two hours uh, ferry crossing um, to, to reach uh, the island. So it's a little remote island. Uh, it's a paradise for itself, but it's not too far away. It's not the Orkney Islands. You can, you can on a clear day, you can see Ireland from the southern coast of Isla. So it's kind of in between the two. 25 kilometers north of Bushmills uh, Distillery, <laughs> to be precise. <laughs> and Udo, as you said, it, the island is shaped like a horseshoe. And well, uh, a little bit. A yes. little bit, yeah. There's the, the lock in between, and there are distilleries that are dotted all along the coastline there, yeah. Um, well, Bowmore and Brooklady uh, are on uh, well, either well, side. Yeah, uh, the only one is Kilhoman, uh, which is um, actually on one of the farms, uh, which grain is in here. It's on the Rockside farm. And that's really in the middle of nowhere, uh, I would we'll call it. And uh, that's a beautiful spot as well. All the rest are on the coast, yes. On the out, uh, the southern east coast is Lafroy Guard Bay, Lagavulin. In the middle are Kilhoman, like Udo said, is landlocked. And that it's a farm distillery. And then Brookladi and Bomor are across each other. And then on the north coast is Kalila, Bunahaven, and soon to be Ardenaho. Oh, and the new Port Ellen will be on the very southern coast, which is where the old Port Ellen was. The first ones that you mentioned, the succession of the the first three, that's the one where you, is that the one where you walk across the bridge? Everybody's sober and they walk straight across the bridge and then yeah. they go and visit <laughs> the, the distilleries and they come back across the bridge and everybody's wobbling. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the three that are, that's the super iodine kind of, all three of them are the big, yes. big, and, and uh, you know, Jim will tell you they get their peep from a similar part of Isla, which is much lower to sea level. And that's why it has a much higher iodine content. Um, and they're all right next to each other. You can walk easily from Art Bag to Lafroy to Art Lagavulin. And, the, and yes. But like Mark said, you might not be able to easily walk home. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody I, I had spoken to, they called that the Isla Wobble. <laughs> nice. So you're talking about the peat. Uh, as we get into the smoke, Julia, would you like to introduce the third sample, the Port Charlotte 2012, and tell us a little bit about the whiskey and maybe share a story about Jim? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for those of you who may not know this, Port Charlotte is the town in which Brook Lottie resides. As Bill mentioned earlier, distilleries were the center of working life. And so when Brook Lottie was closed, it shattered families. People left the island as Bill and Udo were talking about. And uh, Jim felt this really deep, deep responsibility to the residents of Port Charlotte to bring Brook Laddie back and provide that stability and employment. Uh, he felt really that it was his calling to make sure they weren't disappointed again. And he focused on those families that had really specifically been disappointed the most. So the town is part of the distillery and the distillery is part of the community itself. As we all know, his heart is in Isla and there is a passion for serving the island and its people there. Uh, along with that, we also know Jim loved pushing the envelope and breaking barriers. And that's where the creation of Port Charlotte single malt comes through. Uh, critics started saying that whiskey from Brooklady wasn't a true Isla whiskey because it wasn't heavily peated. And this got Jim really pissed off because Brooklady's heart and soul was Isla. If there was ever a distillery that encompassed its people and its community, it was Brooklady. And for critics to be saying, eh, this is an Isla whiskey, yeah, nah. You don't piss off Jim McEwen. Uh, so if they wanted a peated whiskey, that's fine. He'd prove to them uh, that his distillery could do an exemplary peated along with an unpeated. So he created the Port Charlotte single malt. It was peated to the same levels of other prominent Isla whiskeys because, you know, it's always good to prove a critic wrong. So this is the Port Charlotte 2012. It's 50% ABV, 
40 ppm, uh, made from barley from eight different Isla farms, and it was aged in first fill bourbon and second fill wine casks. Oh man, the, the first thought I had when I smelled this whiskey was smoked Gouda. It's, does any, anyone else have like that, that smoky, cheesy vibe? It's really intense. I've never gotten that note off of a peated whiskey before, but it's brilliant. It's absolutely lovely. I was going to say, I got a buttery note, and maybe that, maybe like you say, I, maybe that that's very creamy. There's definitely something rich about it. Uh, again, this, just based on the nose, comes across as a very intense but approachable peated. It's, it's, not, a, it's not too much of an earthy note, though. No. I'd say it's rich and creamy and intense, but it's not punching you in the face of iodine or tar or anything. It's, you smell it and you want to get into it. This is the same peating level as most Laphroaigs or Art Bags or Lagavulins are very close. Right, Udo? Oh. <laughs> yes, um, there is the challenge that uh, Jim had and you were explaining the story of, of getting pissed off not being called a, a proper Isla. Uh, <clears throat> and then there was the challenge of not uh, copying the South mm. Coast. And um, because the, as Greg said, the, the, uh, the, the peat level is the same as an Laphroaig, as an Artbeg or whatever, uh, nearly the same. But uh, what is the difference in this whiskey? And the difference is how it is made. And that is the huge uh, knowledge of Jim and the huge experience and the huge passion. For example, if you, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it, but if you consider this as a pot still and you have the mash into smoky mash and you are at Lafroy, you're going to heat it up very high. And what's happening in the, in, in the pot still is it's doing something like that means all of the heavy alcohols, all of the heavy smokes go through the line arm and, and end up in the bottle. And the difference Jim uh, made was do it low and slow. I think you guys in America all know um, barbecue and, and, and pulled pork, and there is the same thing. Do it low and slow. That means what Jim did was to heat up the, uh, <clears throat> the, the pot stills very soft and tender. And what happened in the pot still was something like that. And so only the very smart smoke goes through the line arm and ends up in the bottle. And that is the main difference. And so this is a very gentle kind of smoke. And as I said before, the fear of uh, smoky whiskeys is absolutely healable because that is something special. That is something different. You have the filigran aromas of smoke into it combined uh, with that beautiful notes of vanilla. And that is uh, absolutely something that uh, can, um, can be a, a soft, tender uh, imagination of smoke. Not a heavy kick in the mouth, but quite a gentle one. Although it's 50 ppm, 50, which is a number. <laughs> You know, the, uh, the, the peat in this, the iodine isn't there. It's uh, the process that they did it. It's unlike the frog, as I like to call it. Uh, I just, I cannot do that. And some of the other, real, what, what I consult, c consider big, bold peat, as high of a number of uh, the peat in here, it's, it's soft, it's pleasant, it's not... It's not that typical bourbon drinkers' expectations. Uh, this is a very delicious whiskey. I mean, I mean this is just a drop dead sexy dram. I, I agree, Chad, and I think Julia hit it on the nose. I, and I didn't think of it that way when I nosed this until I heard her say smoked Gouda. Because Absolutely. It smells like a smoked cheese. I don't know if it's it does, Buddha, but it smells like a smoked cheese. I was kind of getting provolone personally, like a picante <laughs> provolone, but. 
I'm loving no, that. I, I, I do get what you were saying. I still, I'm getting a very distinct leather note. And I, I don't know what that is or if I'm identifying it correctly, but I, I do get sort of that savory, sort of very sort of bottom flavor. And, and to me, I, I, I pick that up as a, as a leathery note, leathery smoked Gouda cheese. Yep. I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. I, I get that in lots of I'm not sure right? I want leathery smoked Gouda cheese. On <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that's interesting that, about these two whiskeys side by side is they're both Isla Barley's. You know, these are both 100% Isla Barley. Some Brooklady whiskey, all Brooklady whiskey is Scottish barley. And, uh, but these are both part of the Isla Barley series. Where So this is just the difference in, the main difference in these two is, is the um, beating. To contrast the two, the um, the Isla Barley and the Port Charlotte, the Isla Barley, the barley is so forward and it it's it's right there. And on this one, it's they're sort of juxtaposed. It's very different. The peat and the smokiness kind of comes forward. And I don't maybe maybe that's sort of the bottom note that I'm getting is is more of the the barley coming through because I'm not getting a sweet vanilla honey follow through i'm getting more of um i don't know if this makes sense but more of like a sweet grassy type of note yeah it's a bit I, more of a herbal sound. i get a very yeah. strong earthy tone on the nose and mm. kind of far in the finish uh towards the back end of the finish i get this and and it's very pronounced for me and and of course we all taste different uh, that's the beautiful thing about discussing whiskeys. I'm sure Jim has had many conversations over the many, many years he was being an innovator in the whiskey industry uh, about that. Uh, but I get this, I, I don't want to say mushroom, but because it's definitely not mushroom and I don't want to pull that body off by saying that, but a, a taste along that earthiness tone uh, that I can't place my finger on it. it, it it's really delicious. So Julia it's funky. That well, with the term herbal, it has mm -hmm. an herbal note. Okay. Yeah. Or if I went out and started licking or chewing on some Isla scrub, I think <laughs> it would be very similar. It it tastes like how I think Isla would taste. <laughs> um. Well, if that's what Isla tastes like, I want to go over to Isla because <laughs> Isla is delicious. So we have a question from one of our members. Uh, again, Robert, Diana, what type of wine casks are used for maturation? I get creamy coconut and almond flavors that make this wildly different than standard Isla peated. Their wine cask finishes which they're famous for changed constantly and now they've been doing for the last i think four years now they've been doing different each year there's a different uh, of the official line um i right here there's a the, the newest one is uh here um hold on snap to focus there we go pac and they use these three digit codes to sort of hint at and you can frankly google them which of the different wine casks they use each year last year was olc right udo and then before yes. that was MRC, and then before that MRC. was MRC. Yeah, so MC CC oh, was yeah. the very first one. And for example, CC was cognac casks, right? Wasn't that the C? Yeah. Yeah, that's not a secret anymore. No, right. That's why. I'm <laughs> and the MR <laughs> and the MRC is also a very famous uh, wine yard in the Bordeaux. Uh, um area you can, you can google it it's it's probably the world's most famous winery right I, to me it is um yeah. i know i don't work for them i can say it but they can't say it i know they've actually encouraged me to say it before <laughs> got another but, tasting note here cake with buttercream icing yeah and that's the, what julia, julia was alluding to that that sort of creamy note mm. yeah and uh, who is it? John Voimus was uh, getting some picante provolone. <laughs> Fancy. Mm. You know, um, one of the things that's interesting, uh, interesting, that was easy to say, um, 
on the Isle of Barley's is how much, if you drink one year after another, they re release a vintage each year. And if you do the 2011 versus the 2012, you can actually taste the sort of seasonal change between them. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely getting this, but I, I, the, usually the big thing was uh, the Isle of Barley's are some years it has a minty note to it and some years it doesn't. And I don't with this at all, but, but maybe last year's did. Mm. There is a slight salinity on the on the very tail end of the finish of this as well. Absolutely. And that goes well with that sort of smoky cheese thing mm -hmm. that's happening. You get that sort of, you get that savory, like I was saying, it's salty, leathery type of finish on this. It's, it, and I, I know this has been said, and I have to say it again. Uh, this is a very approachable peated whiskey even for how much peat is in this it's a very daunting thing and i think people you know get a little scared or there's a reputation or people make fun of it this is this is extraordinarily approachable and there is so much to find in this if you just give it a chance so i you know i say you know dive into something like this because this is incredibly special yeah i completely second that opinion i was surprised by how I can't think of a better word than approachable. I'm surprised by how approachable and easygoing this is, considering it's relatively high peated level, which, I mean, we're gonna get to the Octomore shortly and this is just gonna blow everything away. But, you know, at 40, 50 PPM, mm, To what good. Greg was saying earlier about the, the distilleries, you know, the big, the big three, the, the swampy three, whatever you wanna call them. You know, this is, this is just such a different, experience and I think that this this even go if we go back to the Bomar and if we talk about Jim's influence there's just such a complicated balance that's going on here it, it's 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 pretty insane yeah it's subtle and elegant it's a very elevated whiskey very much and you so. wouldn't and, very much and so. you wouldn't think it would be an elegant whiskey you know what I mean you would think it would be a bruiser but it's not and I think that's Jim in a nutshell um I think he makes these beautiful things out of very, very kind of rough components, you know? Um, and if I can uh, also add uh, another thought on this, not particularly on the, uh, on the poor Charlotte, uh, uh, this one, but uh, when you use peat for, for malting, uh, you receive a, a whiskey afterwards that's a kind of, let's say, liquid history because uh, six inches of peat deep means a thousand years. Oh, and when, wow. they, when they use the, the peat for, um, for the malting, they use things like that, which is 2000 years. So in each glass, there is a kind of period um, <clears throat> Uh, feelable or, or, or tasteable uh, that is <clears throat> two, three thousand years old. And, and that uh, is also something that is pretty fascinating. That is liquid history. That's pretty fascinating. Um, I didn't even think about that. Um, now, now I have a little bit bigger appreciation of scotch. Uh, on, a, on a very funny light note, I know before we move to the Octomore, I want to tell you guys um, a little anecdote. Um, about the creation of Port Charlotte. So when Brooke Lottie decided to, to resurrect, because B Port Charlotte was a whiskey brand years and years ago, probably 90 years ago now, 80 years ago. And when they reopened Brooke Lottie, Jim found out that there was only one guy working there who still had tasted the original Port Charlotte. And Jim said, I want to make a peat of whiskey and I want to name it after the original distillery that was in Port Charlotte. So his name was Rory McLeod. And Jim invited him up to his office to talk to him about what the original Port Charlotte tasted like. And Jim said, Rory, I, I think you might be the last person on Isla who's had the original Port Charlotte. And he said, hi, Jim. Hi, it's probably me. And he said, well, you know, could you tell me a little bit about what it was like? Because we want to resurrect it. And he said, well, Jim, if you could pour me a dram, it might help my memory. <laughs> so he, uh, he gave him a dram of whiskey and he drank it. And he said, uh, so uh, what can you tell me about it? Rory. And he said, well, he said, it was good. 
And he said, well, can you tell me more than that? And he said, well, if you give me another dram, it might help my memory. So he gave him a second dram and he said, well, what else can you tell me about it? He said, well, like what? And Jim said, well, was it smoky? And he said, I, it was smoky. And he said, that's all he remembered. So Jim said, all we had to go on was that it was good and it was smoky. So, <laughs> so we have a comment from a member, Eric Nogura. Uh, he says, I've never liked Pete, but this is nice. Certainly, it tells me that Lagavulin and Lafroy don't hold a candle to this. McEwen's mastery of balance shows in this. Well said. Absolutely. So, and, you know, so, for what it's worth, Jim loves La Lafroy. And so do I. But Jim himself I, tells people all the time he loves Lafroy. You know, um, I think he just wanted to do something completely different. There is, for example, in that book, uh, a story about uh, Jim and his Lefroigs in America. Oh, yeah. And he calls this a legendary drum. And um, it's worth reading. It involves nudity. I know the story. <laughs> I didn't put, do you have I didn't put a, the focus um, on that. Do you have a link we can put up for Udo's book the, for our members to purchase his book? We do. You do? Okay, let's do that because uh, Udo has spent uh, quite a few years uh, writing this book and getting it published and it just came out recently. So there you go. There's the link. Um, and uh, I believe it's also available on Amazon. Is that right, Udo? Yeah, and uh, you can go on wateroflifefilm.com slash shop and you can pre-order it uh, for the States uh, or get in contact with Fonzi and with uh, Greg and um, the, it's, I think, the easiest way to, to purchase it uh, or to buy it. <laughs> yes. Maybe, uh, uh, Alphonse, you can put the link also in, 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 in the chat. We can send it to the, yeah, to the admins and they can share it. But yeah, um, yeah we'll we are the, for you. thank you. Yeah, so it's the, Jim and Udo wrote the book together, but the first edition came out in German and now the English edition is out. So we are, we are as a film, we're importing the book to the US in English. So do we have an approximate landing date of when the English version is going to get here? Specifically, when are you going to overnight it, me, it, my, my it is, copy it, that I... <laughs> It is actually en route. We have um, we have ordered them, but it, it's en route. But we 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 don't have a date on when it's going to arrive. But uh, shortly, I imagine. And Udo's um, massive book tour that he's going to go on and sign everybody's book. <laughs> if if you want to, it's currently being scheduled. <laughs> Udo and I are going to go on a little Tom and Jerry tour together. And Chase, um, I would pay to I would pay to go to that. <laughs> um I might ask you to yeah all right all right so let's move on to our last and final sample the one that scares the bejesus out of me uh the octomore 11.1 11 .1, uh 136.9 parts per million in the peak now I haven't smelt it. I haven't even tasted it yet. And I am kind of sitting here. Yeah, I'm sitting here. Uh, so I will say every expression up to this point has been fantastic. Uh, I think I'm just going to turn my camera off because. <laughs> oh, go for it. <laughs> well, we're waiting. So, we're waiting. Uh, I, Mark for this is going <laughs> to. I've been dreading this for the last month. <laughs> what are you talking about? Mark's going to take us a little bit into this, but I am going to take. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> I, I am. I am never one to air behind the scenes dirty laundry, uh, but I I drew the short straw, so I I had to introduce <laughs> the Octomore. No, I'm I'm totally kidding. I. I got really excited because I started doing the research on this, and I have to tell you, uh, wow, this is this is a, this is a cool moment for me. Like I, I'm I'm getting more and more excited about it. And the problem that I'm going to have is I'm going to have a problem talking and sort of dealing with this at the same time. So if I talk too fast, I apologize. Octomore 11.1. 1. 
this is just an exquisite product. It is born of some brilliant innovation. You can you can sense the renegade spirit here and that fierce nod to sustainability in the product. Um, this is a bit of a paradox, right? It's there's these flavors that are at odds with one another, uh, but but it's it's Jim. It's this acrobatic balancing act, and it's 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 absolute genius. So let's start with some stats, and then let's sort of talk through the process here. Um, it is 59.4 ABV, so this is hot. This has got a little bit of a kick to it. Um, it is five years old, so this particular version is uh, 2013 harvest, 2014 distillation. Um, sit down because we're in a parts per million. The last one, Julia, correct me if I'm wrong, 30, 30 parts? 40, it was 40. 40. 40 parts per million? Yeah. This is 136.9. So this is something that's on a completely different level. Um, matured in first fill Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, or Heaven Hill American oak barrels. And Udo or Greg, if I, if I get any of this wrong, definitely help me out here. Um, I don't want to get too much into geekery, but let's talk a little bit about Octomore. Octomore is the name of the farm where the grain comes from, the grain is concerto and pepino barley uh, that is sent to Rucolati for this. Uh, the farm actually has a really colorful history. If you wanna go back and you, if you just Google Octomore Farm, it goes back to the 1800s. It's a great story. Um, Jim was on a quest to go above and beyond the pork shark, to go big into peated whiskey and to go absolutely through the stratosphere. Um, several attempts were made to smoke the barley to get that ultra, ultra, ultra peated flavor, and they didn't get very far. So one day, I don't know where it was, Udo, maybe you know where it happened, but he happened to be at a market. And there was this stand that was selling what he identified as the best kippers that he had ever tasted, the best smoked kippers that he had ever tasted. And I remember him talking about this and it was like he was right there. He, he had gone right back there and he was eating these kippers right in front of him, basically. So we got to talking with the guy and the guy had, I think Jim described it, it was like this corrugated aluminum shed where he smoked the kippers and it was a cold smoke process. I'm not gonna get into the specifics of cold smoking, but he had a flash of brilliance and he went to his, uh, the people that were doing that particular process for them and said, you think we can do this? And they said, sure, it's your money. Do whatever you want. 136.9 was born as a part of the process. So, you know, again, talking about the brilliance of the innovation of let's just give this a try. Udo, have I missed anything about that story or sort of the origin? Okay. I can listen to you talk all night, Udo, because you have a ton of knowledge, but um, a couple of things. I want you guys to sort of know this, and I, I, I want you to talk about what you're what you're getting. If you have the ability after your first taste, maybe put a drop of water in it if you can for your second second try. Maybe we do a second round. I don't want to drag this out, um, but I think maybe that's sort of an important step here to jump into this and to really get this thing to open up because this is a very very special whiskey and yeah you don't you probably don't want to jump into this if you're just getting into peat uh, but this is definitely something that you want to aspire to from that perspective i'm going to stop talking because i can't walk and chew gum at the same time and i need to nose this and i need to take a taste of, let me throw a couple of tasting notes out from our viewers uh, so Kurt Condon, uh, wow on the nose i'm not getting as much smoke as on the Beaumont or Port Charlotte uh, but maybe I'm getting used to it after the others. Uh, Carrie Stringer says that Octomore matches the Port Charlotte and Nale Barley with a smooth, balanced peat, especially when compared to Lafroig and Ardbeg. No fear needed. Uh, Eric Nogura, again, this is way smoother than I thought it would be. And Robert Diana, oh my God, yum. Salty sweetness again with the peat, salinity, vanilla, earthy peat, lemony, citrus, cocoa, and brown sugar, just fantastic, and you really don't notice the proof. Is, is anyone else getting a really intense banana note 
because for a hot second that was all I could smell. And I'm getting lemon. Maybe I'm having a stroke, but I was. <laughs> and then it on the palate getting a bit more creaminess, like a banana Foster's, mm -hmm. even though it's hotter sure. and spicy, it's not super sweet. Also, I am not, not getting that. On your chest. <laughs> hair on your chest. So if you're wanting to become an animal, like drink this. You've, you've ever grilled grilled a fish Rawr. and you you've thrown lemons on it and the lemons get on the grill and the lemons get the, the char yeah. marks on them. Yeah. That's and and like sea salt, that's what I'm kind of yeah. getting on the nose and on the taste. Just for and Julia, Julia, it's like a to me. It was like I was gonna say plantains, like grilled banana plant, like so yeah. not quite as sweet as like a banana you'd eat, but like a you know that sort of that grilled vibe. Like absolutely. when then you said that bananas, um, you know, like uh, you know, flamed bananas. Yeah. That absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Greg, you, Greg, you and I have been in alignment on kind of some flavor profiles, but for whatever reason, I'm not getting the banana on this one. That's kind of a an interesting turn of events. Yeah, I, I can I can get the plantain notes. The the banana might be a little sweeter than I'm I'm getting, but yeah, I I can see what you're saying, Julia. Hey, before we go too far down the rabbit hole in this, I want to say something quick. I am really really proud that I got on from a WBSE standpoint. I'm really proud that I got Chad Cadden and Bill Varnell to drink <laughs> Octomore. So I'm just, I'm calling that a personal win. <laughs> Cheers to you. So I, I tell you what, I, I was joking with Bill earlier this afternoon about this one. Uh, when I found out what the tasting kit was involved, I'm like, ah, shit. <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, like, <laughs> uh, Everything so far has been absolutely spectacular, and to quite quite frankly, uh, this is freaking delicious. This is, it's not what I was anticipating. Um, seriously, I was literally like, oh, all day about this this pour, and hey, you this want to see is, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say this. This is the picture that we. This is the look we expected on your face. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of Dean oh. Brown's cattle on the Ockmore farm. Spot on there, Fawn. Spot on. <laughs> and it, but, it it even has the Viking horns. Uh, I went ahead and put the drop of water in mine, and I'm sort of letting it open up and sort of doing a part two on this. So I, if people are following along. Uh, I'd love to hear what people have to say about that if, if so they went ahead and did we, it. We were briefly talking about the tasty notes. Uh, I kind of see what Julia and Greg were kind of going with, with the plantain, banana foster, uh, not quite there for me. Uh, I actually kind of going along with Mark, uh, the, the lemon, lemongrass. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, I'm... I'm I'm kind of speechless here, and that doesn't happen much because uh, I do like the gab. Uh, I, I was really expecting this peat bomb, this this explosion of bog. Uh, th this is just a freaking not even close. whiskey. Not even well, remote. And what's, what's funny, Chad, uh, is, is you and I constantly disagree on flavor profiles. I we, mean, we do. Yeah, th we do. There's some commonality, but you and I are definitely at odds much more than we but are this together. just has so so much going on that it, it's it, it's kind of twisted me a little bit um I, i'm shocked i'm i'm really in awe on how delicious this is and jim's approach to doing that with the cold smoking um uh, you know over here people do cold smoking of seafoods and cheeses uh it's a it, it's a interesting process and if i'm not mistaken he cold smoked the peat or the barley rather uh for like a week week and a half somewhere yeah. in that neighborhood uh which is a real long time and once again I'm, not, I, I'm expecting this crazy like holy shit <laughs> and it, this is one of the most delicate beautiful whiskeys i honestly I'm kind of like beside myself with this. I literally want to <laughs> go sit in my chair in the front room and just chill out. All right. So on that note, 
Have a good night, WBSC. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is they've gotten up to 300 parts per million uh, with the peat. Now, have, have they released a whiskey with that? Or? Yeah, well, um, um, just first of all, Chad, welcome to a new universe. And if you remember <laughs> when we talked the first time about the drum, I said, you will love it. And what you said is sound, it's music in my ears. <laughs> and <laughs> when I do every now and then a tasting with an Octomore, I do uh, let the people uh, serve it as a blind taste. And often I am asked, is that a smoky one? And then I tell them, well, it's the heaviest peated whiskey in the world. And which is not particularly this one, with the hundred and what was it, thirty-nine point uh, something uh, ppm, the the highest uh, peating level of a uh, whiskey has been uh, the Octomo eight point three with three hundred and nine ppm. But, but the number is just uh, written on the label to to give transparency, to give information but you won't smell it or you won't um, taste it because anything above a hundred is not, uh, our, our tongue is not able to, uh, to pick this up. So actually you won't find a difference whether it's 140, uh, 180, 250 or whatever. Uh, the only information your tongue gets is it's a lot, <laughs> but it's not exploding in your mouth the uh, the really um, I would say magical moment when when I have an octomoris when you sip it and then the next breath out then the smoke comes from inside and as gentle as it is distilled and that is really something that makes this incredible uh, whiskey like a kind of uh, magical water I would call it and uh, Udo. Jim, when oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, when when Jim uh, w was uh, working on this, uh, he had uh, some experimental uh, uh, distilling made already, and he was often said, "Well, the the top level of smoke is 55 ppm. You can't get over it." And then he turned slightly and around and said, "Well, we just did it." And that's the maverick spirit of uh, of Jim uh, being the first. That is one he he, he told uh, he taught me. Um, he said, uh, "No one remembers the second man on the moon. Be the first. And he was really the first one who pushed the boundaries of peating level. And he pushed it not a, a wee bit. He pushed it." that much and uh, what what he uh, created was uh, was something magnificent and then imagine that what we have now here is the point one uh and the point one means that it was matured in uh, with uh, was made with scottish barley and matured in american oak if you uh, are on uh, on traveling and you see a point two then you will get this high peated level in the wine cask. If you uh, uh, find a 0.3, you will find the Isla <laughs> Barley version. And if you uh, find the 0.4 version, then it's a virgin oak. And these are all four completely different whiskeys, but all not from this world. And that is a hint of paradise in a glass. on Rick's <laughs> brains. Yeah. The, the, I thought the two was uh, distillery exclusive. That doesn't mean that no, you uh, can't. Uh, travel, travel, travel retail travel exclusive. exclusive. Okay, but, okay. But but temp, right for the time being, because global travel has shot, stopped, it's a distillery sure. exclusive. You have to order it from their site. But I will say, and you might disagree, Udo, but I think for someone who's moving to, if you were going to move from bourbon, whatever bourbon it is, to Octomore, the one to do it with is the point fours, because it's virgin oak which is what most bourbons in you know so it's a great kind of you you get the yeah. similar wood influence of um and you know i only found this out the other week i was doing an event like this with lynn McEwen, jim's daughter who's the head of marketing for brooklady now and 
she said they have a rule that whatever the Octomore barley comes out at at the end of the cold smoke, that's what they keep it at. They don't have a target. They're never going to go too low or too high. If it turns out to be 80, so be it. If it turns out to be 800, so be it. And they said that, yes, the highest one is the one Udo mentioned, 8.2. But she said, but she said, keep your eyes, keep your eyes peeled. There's some surprises coming. And I, that's all she said. So I don't. <laughs> I, there I are would always just, surprises coming from Brooklyn. I, I would just he add that to, to Udo's comment. I'll bet you that there are a lot of people out there who love Brooklyn that would probably want to argue with you that they can tell the difference between 100 parts per million and 300 parts per million. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that there's there's people out there that would probably want to argue with that. And then just to address, Julia, your comment, I did put a teeny tiny little drop of water in this just to open it up. And what I will say is when I did that and as I was nosing this and tasting it, I finally got the, I got the plant, I got what I feel is the plantain note that that's no, like I did too based on your oh. Oh. expression and so I put a wee drop in and Jesus oh my god that was like that's what my you all couldn't see it I don't think hopefully not because it was a ridiculous face I made <laughs> oh oh yeah that really opened it up uh, next level so yeah <laughs> Uh, all, eyes were, all eyes were on Chad at that point. To see oh, what yes, happened. that's right. <laughs> the steam, the smoke come, steam come out of his ears. Yes. Chad did <laughs> turn green and fall out of his chair. Which going uh, to Chad is super viewers. pleasantly surprised. Very, very pleasantly, pleasantly surprised. Which, all yeah, right. to your point, Chad and Bill, that you two were both so nervous. At, granted, I was a little bit nervous about the Octomars. I'm like, oh my God, it's so high in Pete. But that speaks to the craftsmanship and the artistry and the skill that went into crafting this phenomenal whiskey. That he was able to make the highest peated whiskey of all time mm -hmm. and yet make it approachable and enjoyable and perfectly balanced. That takes some freaking skill, yo. And hell, we got a twofer out of it for the tasting with that little drop a water trip oh yeah Oof. so i got a couple of comments from our our members here and i've got one of my own i want to add in there as well so lisa carrington says the octomore expressions continue to be my favorite peated whiskey simply lovely uh sandy bearsford says i'm thoroughly surprised how much i'm enjoying the octomore uh and then finally says looks like i'm hitting the liquor store tomorrow and adding to my collection amazing choice <laughs> Salancha, Salancha and my comment is chad and i uh, both were afraid of this because we've had a few whiskeys peated whiskeys that came the peak came from a different area and had a very high iodine content and both of us would be making that face that that uh, steer was making if it had the high iodine uh, content in it uh, we did have one prior to this that we both enjoyed and it was a ben react smoky 12 mm, that's uh, an again, amazing yeah, again, iodine, uh, and I, I'm perfectly fine with that, and I'm sure Chad will agree. We, we both like that. Um, so, Chad? Uh, Jim McEwen means a lot in the whiskey industry. Um, I mean, he's just a remarkable man. He remarkable man into his town. Um, I like Udo. Uh, what did Jim mean to the whiskey industry? Well, uh, <clears throat> I would uh, say if, if Jim hasn't been here or hasn't made uh, his career like he did, uh, we wouldn't talk about whiskey, about Scotch single malt whiskey, because he was a sort of, let's say, game changer. When he was um, in the industry, the single malt was uh, nearly not noticed. It was only blended whiskey that what is what's it all about. And uh, Jim always loved the single malt and he was the one uh, who, who get out in the world and educated people of what is single malt whiskey all about. Of uh, things like non-chill filtering, of things like non uh, adding any E150 to the stuff 
of using uh, barley and and so on and so on things we spoke about and uh, he was i would say the game changer and then it changed and now single malt is actually in scotland the state of the art and uh, it is absolutely reduced to him he is um he's uh one I, i can't imagine of any other who really has um, started this uh, craftsmanship from being a cooper over taking care of a warehouse, of being a blender, of being a manager, of being the, the father of all brand ambassadors, um, and then afterwards creating uh, new distilleries with a new concept like Arden Ho. No one has this whole variety of, 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 uh, of um, achievements in his career. And we're talking about a 50-year-old career. He started at the very 1st of August, 1963. And he ended a few months ago. So that was really something. There is only one Jim McEwen in the world. I, I would say uh, if he would be a soccer player, he would be Pelé. If he would be a musician, he would be Paul McCartney. Uh, he is, uh, for the whiskey world, he is such an iconic personality with so much influence, with so much passion and with so much things he can tell and he can share. And uh, I'm so uh, grateful to uh, to have had the the experience, uh, uh, the experience of, of doing this book together. So I, I got the chance of, uh, let's say, dive in this personality. And as I got to know to him, um, let's say each one of us has maybe this kind of, of spectrum in emotions, downs and ups. Jim has this one. And not only in his personality, also with whiskey. And the way he, he, he was pushing boundaries, not only with the Octomo, there was much more. Uh, the way no one has this spirit of, come on, let's do it. One of his credos is, do it with passion or leave it. And you can smell it in each single whiskey he has made, whether it's the Bomo or it's the Brulati or it's the Portialit or the Octomo. And that is... Uh, really something very special. And I would say um, Jim is somebody who inspired so many people, so many distilleries. He was the very first to use wine casks, for example. Nowadays, wine casks are quite fashion everywhere. And uh, that is one thing I can say where Jim has a kind of uh, influence on the industry. There's so plenty much more. Greg, what would you add? Well, I, I won't say it as well as you have, my friend. Um, you know, I think it's it's in the whiskey, it's in the glass, you know. And the I, I the the thing that Jim says all the time that I get a kick out of and think is really inspirational, and you kind of hinted at it earlier, is he always says, "They said you couldn't do X on Isla. Well, too late. We've just done it." Um, it's funny because he always told us because you know we haven't even talked about this, but he made the botanist gin too. And he's, he told us the story and he said, they told us you couldn't make gin on Isla. Too late, we've just done it. Now, to be honest, in fairness, I don't know who told him he couldn't make gin on Isla. <laughs> he made, I, don't, I don't know what ghost came and said he couldn't make gin on Isla, but you know, he did it. And uh, the I, I spend a lot of time telling people that the Octomore will really kind of, to me, it's like Pink Floyd's The Wall or the Beatles' White Album, or, you know, it's it's, it's so big and so complex. It, it takes a few, you have to sit down with it a couple times before you can wrap your head around it. I've grown quite fond of comparing whiskeys to music. And uh, Brooklady recently released their festival bottle, which was called Laddie Origins. And I, the, the same event I was referencing earlier, I did with Lynn McEwen. I said, this feels like the album the record company didn't want the band to release. <laughs> like it was just all kinds of 12 minute long songs and crazy weird stuff. Uh, but then it did well, like the White Album, I guess, for the Beatles would be the best example of that. But but to me, Jim's stuff is some of, especially the Octomore is just, you know, this, it, 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 every time you drink it, 
it's going to be different than the last time you drink it. It has so much to say to you. And I should warn everyone, when you brush your teeth tonight, your toothpaste is going to taste a little bit like a barbecue. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> um, you know, and I also I wanted to share something, though, um, as we wrap this up, guys, if it's okay. Um, for people who are watching this and didn't get kits, we actually still, we're going to keep the link live. I talked to the guys in Scotland and said they're going to keep the link live. So if anyone wants to try a kit, we have some more of them still. I think we only have like 20 left, but I, 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 we, we do have a few more. So the same link that people have used, the WBSE link, will stay live for a little longer. Beautiful. I, I actually took that down because uh, we only had limited time to sell it. So I think Wednesday was our last day, so I took it down. Yeah. People didn't order it and uh, not get it in time for tonight's event. Yeah. So, so we can share sure. the link in the uh, comment thread. If... Uh... If I may, can I make some final comments? Please. So, so I cheated a little bit and I made my own Infinity Glen Cairn with uh -huh. a little bit of the, the leftovers of everything. So uh, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I'll wait to drink it so I don't get the, uh, so I don't make the cow face that uh, Chad was supposed to make. <laughs> <laughs> I did not make cow face. <laughs> I said you were supposed to make. Uh, the first thing that I want to say is I want to thank Bill and Chad because uh, Bill and Chad have gone to great lengths to bring all of the expertise in the room together. Uh, Udo, you have incredible stories. Uh, Greg, the movie that you have made is absolutely incredible. Julia, your expertise that you brought to the table. Fonz, I don't even need to say anything other than that. The Fonz is the Fonz. Um, you know, Greg, <laughs> you know, Greg, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I vividly remember the day when you called and you asked if, if I wanted to take part in a very special project and and I do owe you a debt of gratitude uh, for that and Udo for everything that you shared um, you know Julia was also sort of a she was the devil on my shoulder contributing other things so as all of this has come together for the Whiskey Network for the Water of Life film for A Journeyman's Journey his autobiography uh, this has just been an absolutely incredible experience and and my my take on jim's impact to the whiskey industry jim is a true blue scotsman to his core and if he says this in the interview if the scots love you they'll love you forever if they hate you they're going to hate you forever so that's a very delicate line to walk and you know, Jim understands the connection between whiskey and a story. Once Jim and I sort of plugged into this, and I'm sure that this is true for you two, Udo and Greg, Jim can tell just an amazing story. And we all know sitting here, you know, that what's the old adage that I keep saying, no great story ever started with, hey, we were sit sitting around having a couple of salads, right? Um, you know, this, just even for this, the incredible experience of, oh my God, I sat down and I had an Octomore and it, it just blew my socks off. It was something that was uh, totally different. Yes, Julia, I understand salads are delicious. I'm just saying <laughs> no great story ever started with, hey, we were having, hey, I had this Cobb salad and then we went on this, we climbed Everest, right? Okay. No, nothing ever like that happened. You know, we tasted some whiskey, we, we fed chad some peated whiskey and he actually liked it okay that's a great story but go back and, and and read the stories you know take part in all three go look at the stories that are in the film get the autobiography take a look at that please visit uh the whiskey network magazine and, and take a look and you can really see the thread that runs through and and what really makes jim McEwen very special all right chad would you wrap this up for us yeah, so on behalf of all of us at WBSA and the Whiskey Network, we'd like to thank our guest, Greg Schwartz, the Fonz, Udo Suntag, and especially Jim McEwen. Um, we wish Jim all the best in his retirement. Um, we thank our members for their participation and support. Don't forget the beautiful film, The Water of Life, spectacular flick. Um, and if you haven't already done so, you can order a copy of the book, A Journeyman's Journey, the Jim McEwen story. Udo? Alan Toast, please. 
So uh, now I think uh, we are on the time uh, to bring this to an end. And if Jim would have been with us, he would have done it in a special way because he is very famous for his um, Highland toast. And um, to do a Highland toast now is quite, um, quite interesting uh, because when I look at my clock, it is nearly four o'clock in the morning. And uh, usually uh, you, you uh, have to imagine that the Highland Toast um, is taken out of a scene where all the clan chiefs came together just the day before they went into a uh, battle. And they didn't know uh, if they will see each other again the day after. So therefore, they came together and, and whiskey had that spirit of bringing people together. And they took the glass and they were aware of that this glass could be the very last whiskey they will ever have. And in that uh, situation, the, the clan chiefs stand up like Chad does now and put one foot on the table. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, get up. Yes. Uh, put one foot on the table oh. and, and then... Then it uh, has a, a choreography. <laughs> uh, I keep sitting and, um, and the first thing is to take the glass and put it three times out of the heart and you shout out as loud as you can uh, do. Mark, 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 then you take the glass three times to the heart and you say, Stalish! 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 Then you take it and raise it up uh, three times and you say, Stalish! Stalish! Oh, oh, please. Please. Fourth time you have the enemy just sitting in front and you will put the sword down and say, And then on the left you say, And And afterwards you shout, Slungivar, and you dump it down in one sip. And I th that was just practicing, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. There's more. <laughs> so now you know all what to do. First out, then in, then up, then down. Slunge your right, slunge your left, slunge your bar, and down. Okay, ready? Okay, then we go. Marvelous. 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 Stainless. 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 Swastless. 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 It was a pleasure. Remember. <laughs> Always remember. Ah. Off the board, bottle. man. Share poor. Cheers, WBSC. <laughs> That's some serious shit. Oh my god.